And so to take aim at the trait itself and deem it as inherently toxic, harmful, and problematic is, in essence, an attempt to label masculinity itself as inherently toxic, harmful, and problematic. Alright, so in my last video about the differences between men and women, I ended the video by saying this. To put it bluntly, there are differences in our nature that changes to society simply cannot fix. And if we keep expecting it to, then we will only continue to fuel the already polarizing, hyperbolic, and divisive conversations concerning the differences between men and women. Essentially what I'm saying here is that while I wholeheartedly believe that we should constantly be evaluating and re-evaluating our social norms and expectations, I patently disagree with the notion that society is to blame for every discrepancy that we observe in our culture, especially as they pertain to the differences between men and women. In other words, there are innate biological differences between the sexes that society may unduly reinforce, but that society is ultimately not the cause of. And if we keep expecting societal changes to fix these discrepancies, and if we keep failing to acknowledge these biological differences, then we will only exacerbate the tension between the sexes, and the public discourse between men and women will only continue to devolve. And I spent my last video presenting the scientific research exploring these differences that has concluded that innate biological differences do in fact play a significant role in shaping our predispositions and behaviors. But for this video, I wanted to demonstrate just how this discourse is manifesting, and how it has inevitably led to the subconscious belief that men are essentially just broken women. Because over the last decade or so, with the advent of the Me Too and Time's Up movements, the growth of the manosphere and some of its more extreme factions, and the increasing influence of feminism, male behavior as a whole has been put under a society-wide microscope. And as we seek to understand male behavior from this cultural standpoint, the lion's share of responsibility has been placed on society's impact on male behavior, resulting in the assertion that men are the way that they are primarily and maybe even exclusively because they have been socialized to behave this way. And so of course, if socialization is the cause, then socialization must be the solution. And this has led us to the belief that if men were simply socialized differently, then all of their problematic behaviors would start to disappear. And of course, I don't deny that there is merit to this idea. As I mentioned in my previous video, I, and many if not all of the proponents of the biological factors argument, agree that social expectations play a significant role in determining our behavior. So no, I don't unconditionally object to the idea that making changes to society will have a positive impact on male psychology and behavior. However, the current socialization argument blatantly ignores these biological differences, and as a result, seeks to impose socialization practices that do not resonate with, and subsequently, do not work for men. And as you can imagine, many if not all of these imposed socialization practices come directly from women. The current discourse around fixing male behavior stems from the belief that female socialization practices are the key, and if men simply adopt these practices, then they will cease their problematic behaviors. And thus, the subconscious belief that men are essentially just broken women, or that they are basically just women who have been inappropriately socialized has taken root in our public discourse. And in my opinion, this represents a widespread fundamental misunderstanding of the factors that make men and women different. And I genuinely believe that adherence to this subconscious belief will only do more harm than good for the mental well-being of both sexes. It's gone to the point where intrinsic differences in what men and women seek in their friendships is framed as good and healthy in the female scenario and shallow and immature in the male one. A few months ago, a video of a transgender man detailing his experience since transitioning went viral. And for a lot of people, this video served as a revelation of what it's like to be a man in Western society. Nobody told me how lonely being a man is. And they had all these comments about like um, justifying the coldness to men, which is valid. But to just be remembered like, oh, that's right. Everybody just sees you as the villain. But to have known, and I think a lot of trans men feel this, is we knew what de depth felt like before we transitioned. We knew what it felt like to like have people want to hug us and to have people want to talk to us and to have a community. And then you transition and you're just a guy walking down the street that people cross the street so that they're not near you. And friendships are so much harder to build and people are colder. I joke that I have, I had closer friendships with random women I met in the bathroom before I transitioned at clubs because of how open women are than I've had in my eight years of transitioning because women are just so much more vulnerable and deep than men. And what's hard is none of this invalidates how real and raw women and people who are in marginalized groups feel about cis white 
men. All of that's valid. But I also now understand why the suicide rate is so much higher in men. Because this shit is lonely. And I'm an emotionally mature man. I know how to build friendships, and it is still really, really hard. Try to think about how you can, in your small little community where you feel safe, can reach out to the men in your life and just help them feel maybe seen for a moment. Or do do little little conversations to help their emotional maturity so that they can reach out to people and have deeper guy friendship. And so for many, the key takeaway from this video was that yes, it is indeed very lonely to be a man. No, as a man, nobody's just gonna wanna come up and hug you, not random strangers and not even really your friends. And yes, people are usually very wary in approaching men for the purpose of just starting up a conversation. And this is a bit of a side note, but ironically enough, a lot of the reason for this trepidation is due to how the general public feels towards men. Feelings that the speaker here actually echoes and believes are completely valid, which personally, I would argue you is a bit of a contradiction seeing as this video's creation was a direct consequence of those same generalized derogatory feelings towards men. But again, that is a separate discussion entirely. In any case, it does make sense that someone who has lived life as a woman and has experienced the social advantages that would come with that experience would find it shocking and in this case traumatic that the opposite sex is not at all entitled to those same benefits. And it is important that as a man who has never experienced those advantages, I make an effort to empathize with this person and offer my sympathy for the harsh reality that they are now experiencing. But in return, I would also ask that those who have experienced the other side would also extend that empathy towards those of us who haven't and make an attempt to understand that our biology and our lived experiences may have left us with different wants and needs. Wants and needs that are diametrically opposed to their own. And this sentiment was heavily reflected in the comments because ultimately it would seem that most men do not have the same desires. No, on average, men don't want to form random relationships in a public restroom. On average, men value their solitude. And on average, men don't necessarily want their friendships with other men to resemble the friendships that women have with other women. And the fact that most men don't desire these things does not mean that they are less deep, less open, or less emotionally mature. It just means that men, on average, have different wants and needs when it comes to their relationships. But I do want to make it clear that I'm not denouncing what this person is describing in this video, because it is undoubtedly true that men suffer from higher rates of loneliness and are four times as likely as women in the West to successfully commit suicide. And so I wholeheartedly agree with at least part of his solution that people should at least make an effort to help men feel appreciated for factors outside of their ability to protect and provide for their loved ones. But as to the notion that men need to become more emotionally mature in order to exhibit deeper male relationships, again, in this case, deeper just means female because the speaker quite obviously still desires a more feminine style of friendship, even though that is not not a style of friendship that most men, on average, aspire to. And so even in situations where men's troubles are highlighted and addressed, the proposed solution is essentially for men to adopt a more feminine approach in their relationships in order to heal. Which again, perpetuates this notion that men are essentially just broken women. And of course, this video isn't the only example of this mindset. In my research, I came across several accounts from transgender men who detailed similar experiences to the man from the previous example. This speaker in particular discusses the differences in the way men interact with him now compared to when he was a woman. Another thing is experiences with waiters, and this extends itself to like coworkers or like anyone, I guess your first meeting at social gatherings, but it's like, if you really pay attention now to how people treat the guys at your table and then the girls at your table when they're waiting on you, it's so drastically different. But in my experience, when waiters would come up to us, when I was a female, you know, they're very polite and they're like, hi, what can I get you guys? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, sounds good, blah, blah, blah. And very polite like that. And then literally now that I'm a guy, they'll turn to me and it's like, what's up, bud? What you need? And it's like so informal, like they don't give a it's, it's basically like, I don't like how little guys pay attention to you when you're a guy. But it's like any social gathering, there's like, sub dude, and they shake your hand and walk off. It just feels rude. I guess a lot of the time. Same with coworkers. At jobs that I've started when now that I'm a guy, throughout the years, it's like all my guy coworkers, if I'm starting like with another girl or something, they'll be like, hi, nice to meet you, how are you? And we're like, sup dude? And they're just like not even introduce themselves. They won't get to know me. And I'm like, what is this weird, like assuming we just don't give a about each other?
And again, for someone who has experienced life on the other side, I imagine it must be quite a culture shock to experience what it's like when people stop going above and beyond to be kind to you. But for a lot of men, this style of interaction is not considered as rude and is actually preferable. And this sentiment was again reflected in the comments. I've always thought the way men nonchalantly speak to men they don't know in public is a form of respect in that they are being real with each other and not putting on that fake polite front that is expected. When addressing another man, they show him respect by dropping the act. And this observation came from a person who doesn't even participate in this male dynamic, which suggests to me that it is an easy enough concept to grasp if one is willing to step outside of their own personal desires and actually approach these interactions from the perspective of the group that they are trying to understand. And of course, there were plenty of men in the replies who co-signed this comment. But again, we see that typical male dynamics that men seemingly take no issue with are seen as rude or impolite and as problems that need to be fixed. And of course, the way to fix those problems is for men to behave more like women. Because ultimately, this critique is wrapped up in a very popular belief that was espoused in the previous example as well. And that is the belief that men simply lack the emotional maturity that women are believed to just naturally embody. And I just get along typically with girls better. Generally speaking, they tend to be a, li a little bit more like advanced in their emotions and communication and that's how I grew up. Now, just to be clear, I wholeheartedly believe that men, on average, do need help in achieving and sustaining emotional maturity. I do not refute this claim in the slightest, but as to the discussion of which sex is more emotionally mature, I personally believe this argument to be a waste of time and completely irrelevant to the larger issues at hand. But what is important is how, in our general understanding of this concept, we've begun to conflate increased emotional expression with emotional maturity. Because it is often the case that men's unwillingness to express their emotions is seen as a sign of emotional immaturity, especially when compared with women's enthusiasm for emotional expression. But the idea that more expression is a sign of higher levels of maturity is a fallacy, and the various definitions of this concept confirm this. The National Institutes of Health define emotional maturity as the ability of an individual to respond to situations, control emotions, and behave in an adult manner when dealing with others. The American Psychological Association defines emotional maturity as a high and appropriate level of emotional control and expression, and goes on to illustrate emotional immaturity as a tendency to express emotions without restraint or disproportionately to the situation. The American Behavioral Clinics define emotional maturity as one's ability to understand and manage their emotions. An emotionally mature person has reached and continues to work at reaching a level of self-understanding with regard to their thoughts and behaviors and decides how to best approach and cope with situations that might otherwise be trying or challenging. In all of these definitions, the point of emphasis is on appropriate emotional expression, not increased emotional expression. And so the idea that men need to adopt a more feminine approach and express their emotions more in order to achieve emotional maturity is, by definition, a fallacy. What truly matters for emotional maturity is for one to be able to internally articulate their emotions to themselves so as to understand what feelings are assailing them at any given moment and respond accordingly to whatever circumstances that they are outwardly faced with. If a person chooses not to share their emotions with another, that is definitively not a sign of emotional immaturity. And the notion that it is is just another sign that typical male psychological tendencies are seen as harmful and toxic, while female tendencies are seen as the gold standard, which again perpetuates the notion that in order for men to heal themselves, they need to adopt these more feminine psychological approaches. Now again, I will continue to reiterate that I am not trying to make the argument that men don't need mental, psychological, or emotional help. They absolutely do. There is too much evidence that confirms that men too often pivot from controlling their emotions to suppressing their emotions. And this is something that is commonly understood, even in pop culture. And while, yes, this is pretty funny, there is actually a lot of truth to what Bill Burr is alluding to here, which is that men typically avoid displaying any sensitive emotions out of a fear of being derided by not only their male counterparts, but by society as a whole. And due to the pervasiveness of this belief, I think we would all easily recognize Burr's joke as a good example of emotional immaturity in men. But there are also plenty of culturally relevant examples of women exhibiting emotional immaturity as well.
But in pop culture, this type of behavior is not recognized as emotional immaturity. In fact, as demonstrated in the video, it is usually expected of the man to telepathically understand what is truly being communicated and adjust himself accordingly. Instead of the responsibility falling on the woman to demonstrate some level of emotional maturity and appropriately express what she is dealing with. And so these examples demonstrate that according to the definition, from a cultural standpoint, both men and women show clear signs of emotional immaturity. Yet only one of these examples is commonly referred to as such, while the other is overlooked and just seen as a reality that we all must accept. Failing or refusing to identify these culturally pervasive female behaviors as emotional immaturity is part of the reason why women are believed to be more emotionally mature than men, which in turn reinforces this ingrained belief that adopting female socialization practices and psychological processes is the key for men's emotional progression. And this belief isn't only perpetuated by pop culture and one-off viral videos. No, this notion is actually at the very core of the mental health industry. Now again, as I've repeatedly tried to make sure that I reiterate, men do in fact need help. Just because I am arguing in support of the fact that men are distinctly unique from women and that their emotional maturity is being misrepresented does not mean that I believe that men are not suffering immensely not only from societal pressures, but also from their own self-perpetuating behaviors. But the unfortunate reality is that the avenues provided for men to acquire that help are uniquely female. Over the past decade or so, therapy has become a staple in modern discourse. It's gone to the point where many people, usually women, will actually go so far to list enrolling in therapy as a requirement in a dating partner. In other words, if you're a man who is not in therapy, go ahead and swipe left. But it is widely known that men tend to avoid seeking therapy. And the reason for this is thought to be commonly understood. Obviously, men are socialized to be independent and handle their problems, both mental and physical, completely on their own. Getting help from external sources is seen as weakness. And since men don't want to be seen as weak, they avoid seeking therapy. Now, obviously, this diagnosis is a reflection of the previously mentioned socialization argument, and that it seeks to place all of the blame for men's avoidance of therapy on social expectations. And of course, I will continue to affirm the merit of this belief. I do not for a minute disagree with the notion that we need to identify the problematic ways in which men are socialized that prohibits them from asking for help. However, as I mentioned earlier, I do believe that this approach completely neglects the biological factors that may be contributing to the sex disparity in therapy enrollment. Psychologists have been trying to understand and diagnose this problem for decades now, frequently coming back to socialization as the root cause. And yet, despite this research spanning at least the past 30 years, we still see article after article today asking the question of why men don't seek therapy, suggesting that we haven't really made much progress in answering this question. So what is truly the cause of this disparity? Well, I believe that this article from Vice perfectly encapsulates the problem. Dr. Ronald Levant, whose name will come up in almost every article dealing with men's mental health, is a former head of the American Psychological Association and professor at the University of Akron who has spent decades researching men and mental health. And he notes that the world of psychotherapy was originally created by men to treat women. Today, while the APA has issued guidelines for the treatment of a variety of specific populations, ethnic, linguistic, and culturally diverse populations, girls and women, lesbian, gay, and bisexual clients, older adults, and transgender and gender non-conforming people, there are still no guidelines for the treatment of men and boys. Levant's observations are corroborated across the mental health industry. This article from Psychology Today dives even further into the sex disparities in psychotherapy. Over the past few decades, the vast majority of psychotherapists, as well as the majority of people seeking psychotherapy, are female. Psychotherapy has become primarily women talking to women. With the advent of the women's movement and the feminization of psychotherapy, I believe that men are increasingly reluctant to seek psychotherapeutic help. I think that men understand correctly that most therapeutic approaches are increasingly designed for and intended to be attractive to their primary customers, women. And so we come across the first glaring issue. Aside from the stigma that men face whenever they decide to seek mental health assistance, they are also expected to enter a space that is specifically not designed for their needs and sensibilities. As we can see, the notion that men need to feminize their psychological tendencies in order to heal runs deep and goes beyond the sphere of social media and into the established, legitimate, and professional world of the mental health industry as well. And so is it any wonder that men in 
general, even after realizing that they're suffering, still refrain from entering therapy. But this is only the first set of hurdles that men are expected to overcome. The Vice article continues. According to Wisdom Powell, a clinical psychologist and director of the University of Connecticut's Health Disparities Institute, everyone has a role to play. I often talk about how complicit we all are in maintaining these more harmful, toxic norms, she says. So I would say the first thing we can do is to try to create a culture to disrupt the narrative around silent suffering and the expectations for men to be strong, stoic, and silent. Now, I completely understand and agree with the notion that we should work to lessen the burden that we put on men by expecting them to be strong, stoic, and silent. What if that is precisely what men, on average, aspire to for reasons outside of their socialization? What if there are biological factors that leave men predisposed to seeking to embody these very traits? What if strength and stoicism are characteristics that men strive for, not because they were taught to, but because they are naturally predisposed to seeking them out? Is it possible that discussing these traditionally male traits as inherently negative is part of the reason why so many men refrain from seeking therapy. Again, I fully support the endeavor to alleviate the pressure of having to be strong, stoic, and silent, but there is no consideration here to the possibility that these traits aren't entirely a result of socialization practices and are actually manifestations of inherent male biological desires. And so for the men who do place value on being strong and stoic, wouldn't they just consider these objectives to represent an attempt to dismantle certain aspects of masculinity itself? Because as the article explains, the authors boil down traditional masculinity to seven basic norms. Avoidance of femininity, homophobia, self-reliance, aggression, achievement slash status, attitudes towards sex, and restrictive emotionality. If you're a man, perhaps it's time to think about how you relate to these ideas. And if you're a woman, feel free to tell a dude about Levant's male role norms inventory online quiz. Okay, so snide uh, gender-based condescension aside, obviously some of these traditionally masculine basic norms are objectively harmful, like homophobia. That absolutely has no place in masculinity and rightly deserves to be denounced, and is part of the reason why I support the constant evaluation and re-evaluation of social norms and expectations, as I stated in the beginning. Because homophobia, unfortunately, has been considered an aspect of masculinity, and this discriminatory mindset absolutely needs to die out. However, are the other traditionally masculine traits listed here inherently bad? Self-reliance is a positive trait, right? Regardless of sex. Avoidance of femininity, seeking achievement in status, aggression, attitudes towards sex, and restrictive emotionality are all conditionally measured. There is nothing inherently wrong with these traits as long as they are tempered. Of course they can become toxic when they aren't regulated, but that can be said of literally any personality trait, including traditionally feminine ones. Sensitivity, modesty, emotionality, passivity, avoidance of masculinity, and dependence are all traditionally feminine traits that are perfectly fine when tempered, but that become equally toxic when unmanaged. So why are these aspects of masculinity seen as inherent negatives that men should reconsider their adherence to? Perhaps it's because masculinity itself is seen as the problem in psychotherapeutic spaces that are designed for feminine sensibilities. Now, I know that this may sound hyperbolic, but the article does conclude with this quote from Dr. Levant. A guy's mental health and his conception of manhood are often closely linked. Levant says that while millennial men seem to be more comfortable straying from rigid gender norms, for most men, particularly those over 35, pretty much everything you learned about being a man when you were a kid is wrong. And there it is. All of those traditionally masculine traits that a lot of men place value in due to factors that are completely unrelated to their socialization, like self-reliance, emotional control, seeking achievement and status, toughness, resiliency, stoicism, etc., are all inherently wrong. And the industry of psychotherapy is here to teach you why. Of course, it is completely valid to assert that these traits, when taken to their extremes, become toxic, unsustainable, and detrimental to the very people who seek to embody them. But again, that is true of literally every personality trait or characteristic. And so to take aim at the trait itself and deem it as inherently toxic, harmful, and problematic is, in essence, an attempt to label masculinity itself as inherently toxic, harmful, and problematic. And again, these solutions are born of the belief that all of these traits were simply forced upon men by previous generations. But evolutionary psychology teaches us that men and women are genetically predisposed to certain behaviors, activities, and traits. Of course, we we are not solely defined by these predispositions. And of course, there will be significant overlap between the sexes. And it must also be said that these predispositions are not determinative and do not limit our interests and abilities in many regards. But these predispositions exist nonetheless. And so it is not only possible, but in fact, extremely likely that these traditionally masculine traits are a result of our evolutionary predispositions and not solely a result of societal norms and expectations. And of course, I agree with these researchers and psychologists 
psychologists that social norms and expectations have undeniably reinforced these traits and behaviors to a point where they have become untenable. But disregarding the biological component of this equation is, in my opinion, precisely the reason why this issue has been debated for the past 30 years with little to no progress. For a lot of men, these traits are desirable, and so the entire mental health industry's attempt to label them as inherently toxic is essentially interpreted by these men as an attack on masculinity itself, and leaves them disinclined from seeking this industry's assistance even after they've realized that they're suffering. And so for the industry to turn around and place all of the blame on these men inevitably only deepens the divide. Another researcher cited in this article named Dr. Zach Seidler started his analysis by genuinely trying to understand why men were not staying in therapy. We're getting more and more men into therapy, but lots of them are not sticking with it. The researchers polled 20 men who have received treatment for depression and asked them about experiences in therapy. Most troublingly, he says, despite a recent push throughout the Western world for men to get treatment, male suicide rates haven't dropped significantly. But by the end of this article, Seeler was propagating the same message that men have heard for the past 30 years. The world has changed, he says, and men need to relearn ways of being in the world that are more flexible and emotionally generous. Men need to stop being afraid of their feelings, he says, and being scared of therapy too. And so the message that the industry is sending to these men is that at the end of the day, this is all still their fault. Their reluctance to seek therapy has nothing to do with the fact that this industry is definitively not designed for them. It has nothing to do with the fact that these so-called toxic traits are likely a result of genetic predispositions and are only reinforced by socialization practices, not caused by them. And of course, it has nothing to do with the fact that the industry sees masculinity itself as the problem. No, this is all just due to the fact that men are emotionally immature and afraid of their feelings. So essentially, men, you need to get over yourselves and go to therapy. And most fittingly, this article ends with a quote from the aforementioned Dr. Wisdom Powell. As society pushes forward in its awareness of the unique mental health needs of men and boys, it's also important to remember that this isn't just about the guys. When men suffer from mental health problems in silence and fall victim to substance abuse or suicide, it's often women and girls who are left to pick up the pieces and take on caregiving burdens, she says. So ultimately, even as we identify men's issues and specifically point out the fact that men commit suicide at a much higher rate than women, we still have to place an inordinate amount of focus on the women and girls who are affected by men's mental health issues. Now, this is a bit of an aside, but it was interesting to see just how many of these articles brought up the women and girls and the friends and families that are affected by men's struggles. This APA article, while hitting all the same notes as the Vice article about how men need to essentially get over themselves and go to therapy, also alludes to this dynamic, stating, this inability, reluctance, or straight up unwillingness to get help can harm men's own mental and physical health, and can make life more difficult for their friends and families. Again, placing the focus on the people that these men have a responsibility to. And while I agree that yes, reluctance to get help will have a negative effect on the people surrounding them, I still genuinely believe that the focus should remain solely on the person that is suffering, man or woman. Maybe I'm wrong, and please feel free to let me know if you think differently. But this all just reminded me of that Hillary Clinton quote from 2015, where she asserted that women have always been the primary victims of war. And of course, I don't dispute the fact that women also suffer immensely from war. Yes, Hillary Clinton was right. They do lose their husbands, fathers, and sons, and that is undeniably tragic. But it would seem to me that the primary victim here is the person who lost his life, and it is the same in this context. Isn't the primary victim here the man who felt so isolated, misunderstood, and rejected by not only society, but also the mental health industry, that he felt he had no other choice but to take his own life? Shouldn't the message being sent to these men reflect a desire for them to get better for themselves and not just to appease their wives, girlfriends, friends, and families. Because when we speak of women's mental health, rightfully so, we don't bring up the husband or the boyfriend who has to deal with her mental instability. No, the focus is 100% on her getting better for her own happiness as it should be. But for men, there is always a focus on the people that they have a responsibility to. And again, maybe I'm wrong. And again, please feel free to let me know if you disagree. But I have to be honest, to me, this all just feels like a cruel and callous guilt trip. I don't think it's wild to interpret this as a message from the industry that is essentially saying, hey men, go to therapy not so that you can just try to find peace and happiness within yourself, but more importantly, so that you can stop being a burden to your wives, girlfriends, friends, and families. And personally, I just find it interesting how these researchers will constantly condemn society for putting all of these external pressures on men, while simultaneously putting all of these external pressures on men by suggesting that they aren't even the main focus 
in their own mental health journeys. And that this isn't just about them, but about the well-being of their loved ones, specifically the women that they love. What up, Editor Feef here. So you may have noticed a shift in tone in this last section, so I just kind of wanted to explain that really quickly. So if you've seen any of my videos from before I started commenting on culture and society at large, then you'll know that for the first year and a half, this channel was essentially dedicated to my mental health. And that's because for the previous 10 years, I had been going through this depressive and addictive cycle that had ultimately left me feeling like I didn't want to be here anymore. And I just remember that one of the thought patterns that really reinforced that belief in me occurred whenever I would shift my focus away from myself and onto my loved ones. Because in that state of mind, it's very hard not to think of yourself as a burden to them. You know, ever since I got to high school, I have kind of been a problem for my family. But thanks to my deteriorating mental state, for over a decade, I was an unsolvable problem for them. And so of course I thought to myself, well, if I wasn't here, then they wouldn't have to deal with this problem. And I felt very justified in that belief. Sure, they might be angry or upset for a couple of years maybe, and sure, they have a bunch of other problems that they're constantly dealing with, but they tend to solve those problems and move on from them. This particular problem hasn't gone anywhere for over a decade, and so why not just relieve them of that problem. And so when I see this type of messaging from the mental health industry, I immediately get worried. Because if there are men out there who are now in a similar state of mind to where I was a few years ago, then that message of, hey, think of your wives, girlfriends, friends, and families who are suffering because you don't get help could be enough to push them over the edge. So again, I'm sorry if I got a little heated there. I still stand by my argument and everything that I said here. And I do still believe that I was being objective here, despite my subjective experience informing the intense city with which I spoke about this topic. But also, if you feel that I lost objectivity here and was just speaking from a place of personal experience, that is completely valid. And again, please let me know if you disagree with what I'm saying here in the comments. But with that said, let's just get back to the video. And so just to recap, the primary lifeline that is offered to men to help them move past their emotional turmoil and mental inhibition is a space that isn't designed for them, that doesn't recognize their innate desires and predispositions, that views masculinity itself as the problem, and that doesn't even see them as the primary primary focus in their own mental health journey. And yet we wonder why men avoid going to therapy. And you don't have to just take my interpretation at face value. There are studies that show that these attitudes towards masculinity are counterproductive and are actually the problem. A comprehensive study of men's mental health in the psychotherapy industry conducted by the National Institutes of Health suggested that one longstanding hypothesis critiques restrictive ideals of traditional masculinity, e.g. strength and stoicism, as contradicting the emotional vulnerability and communication needed to access and fully engaged with effective psychological treatment. Or in other words, as we've already discussed at length, there is a deep-rooted belief that traditionally masculine traits like stoicism inherently inhibit men's ability to be vulnerable and communicate their emotions. The study continues, such deficit-based perspectives regarding male socialization have been contested. Notably, with the rise of strength-based approaches to men's psychological treatment has come a focus on the limitations of services and clinicians to treat a diverse male clientele. These limitations include inadequate clinician training in gender social socialization, clinicians' biases towards or against masculinity, and structural barriers and unappealing service environments. So essentially, this analysis called out everything that we previously talked about. Clinicians may have an incomplete understanding of gender socialization, its effects, and its limitations. Clinicians may also carry certain biases against masculinity itself. And of course, the typical psychotherapeutic environment is potentially unappealing to male sensibilities. The article then references a particular study that confirmed not only how traditional psychotherapeutic approaches alienate and punish men, but also how acknowledging and praising traditionally masculine traits could transform this entire process for male therapy patients. The study used the PPPM model for psychotherapy with boys and men. PPPM stands for positive psychology, positive masculinity, and is meant to be the antithesis to the deficit-based perspectives regarding masculinity that most psychotherapy spaces adhere to. The purpose of the PPPM model is to emphasize male strengths as the starting point for psychotherapy with boys and men. So so for example, instead of seeing male self-reliance as an inherently toxic trait that needs to be dismantled, as the Vice article suggested earlier, this study attempts to affirm the utility of this trait for men and support its existence by demonstrating what healthy self-reliance
self-reliance looks like, asserting that a boy or man with a healthy dose of self-reliance considers the input of others with regards to problems, yet he remains his own man and does not allow others to force their decisions on him. At the same time, he expresses his self-reliance in relation to others, considering their needs and how he can serve them. And on the subject of male humor, the study suggests many boys and men use humor as a vehicle to attain intimacy, as a means of having fun and creating happy experiences with other boys, as a foundation for building and supporting a friendship, as a way to demonstrate that they care about others, and as a strategy to reduce tension and manage conflicts. Also, research indicates that boys and men use humor as a healing and coping tool in times of stress and illness. And in a world where male humor is often seen as a defense mechanism or a reluctance to engage in emotional vulnerability, this study instead suggests that humor between men simply represents a different avenue towards achieving the same goal of emotional connection. No, it isn't inherently wrong to resort to humor in times of emotional turmoil, and no, this predisposition shouldn't always be interpreted as an attempt to deflect away from certain emotions and realities. In fact, it is often through this method that men process their emotions, and so it shouldn't be condemned. In a case study, one of the researchers, who was referred to in this paper as Dr. K, began seeing a male therapy patient who went by the alias Clifford. Clifford had been having problems with his wife and daughter, and so he sought help from a friend who suggested that he try therapy. Out of desperation, Clifford acquiesced, but unfortunately, the psychologist that Clifford originally went to represented all of the problems with the psychotherapy industry of today as they relate to men's psychological needs. Clifford complained that the prior psychologist was bent on pointing out everything wrong with him and made him feel like he was useless. Clifford recounts, he, the psychologist, had completed his analysis of our family and had decided that the whole root of our family problems was because I was a typical man. He accused me of not knowing how to show that I cared for my family after my wife complained to him that I am not romantic enough and my daughter complained that I'm always at work and that my time at work is why I don't know a thing about her. He also said that I feared intimacy because I like to tell a joke here and there when things got really tense. And then he told me I was out of touch with my feelings and had to work on that. When he said that crap to me, I was through with him and I never went back to him. And unfortunately, this is an all too common story for men who seek therapy, especially for relationship purposes. They will often be made to feel as if they are the problem, that their needs come second to their families, and that their preferred approaches to dealing with situations is toxic and harmful. And again, this is precisely why so many men avoid these spaces. Fortunately, in this case, Dr. K's PPPM model allowed Clifford to get the help that he and his family needed. Dr. K goes on to outline the multiple mistakes made by the original psychologist, and in so doing, highlights the same issues within the psychotherapy industry that we've already discussed. After listening to Clifford, Dr. K realized that the first psychologist had made some crucial mistakes. First, he had failed to fit his psychotherapy approach to Clifford's male action orientation, instead limiting himself to a passive analytic mode that made Clifford uncomfortable. Second, the psychologist appeared to operate from a deficit perspective about men, which was conveyed in a judgmental fashion through his comments about Clifford being a typical man and not knowing how to show care for his family. Third, the first psychologist demonstrated the common biased assumption among therapists that men are hypo-emotional by stating Clifford was not in touch with his feelings, even though that was not necessarily the case. Fourth, he viewed Clifford's use of humor as a dysfunctional attempt to avoid intimacy, rather than realizing that Clifford was actually trying to help manage the tension in the family. Fifth, he had made no effort to look for, affirm, and build upon Clifford's existing male strengths. In light of these mistakes, it is not surprising Clifford felt alienated. Suffice it to say, through Dr. K's work with Clifford, his reaffirming of Clifford's existing male strengths, his understanding of male predispositions and traits, his acknowledgement and understanding of male psychological tendencies, his unwillingness to instinctively demonize masculinity, and his genuine attempt to create a space suitable for male sensibilities, Dr. K was able to work with Clifford and his wife to get their family to a more manageable space. When the couple terminated counseling with Dr. K, Elaine, Clifford's daughter, was still moody and at times snippy with her parents, but her behavior had greatly improved so that both parents were feeling less worried about her future. In addition, Alice, Clifford's wife, and Clifford felt more united as parents, and this change had brought them closer together. They agreed to return for therapy should they ever need assistance again. And so this case study clearly demonstrates that the current configuration of the psychotherapy industry is set up to cater to female sensibilities, and either inadvertently or intentionally punish masculinity. But in this case, fortunately for Clifford, Dr. K was willing and able to acknowledge and affirm these traditionally masculine traits, which in turn opened him up to a more positive and healing therapeutic experience. And I personally believe that this success can be replicated on a larger scale if these changes are adopted en masse. Therapy should be appealing for men who place more value in traditionally masculine traits. However, in order for this to happen, significant changes must be made to the industry's approach in dealing with men. And also, maybe try not to blame men for being unwilling to enter a space that not only isn't designed for them, but that also seeks to dismantle the very things that they
they place value in. And the fact that research and surveys confirm that men tend to prefer the dynamics in male group therapy meetings over the dynamics of the traditional one-on-one -on -one talk therapy session only reinforces the observations made in this video and by researchers like Dr. K and his team. Because these spaces are male-friendly, they do not demonize masculinity since most, if not all, of the members and leaders are men who value traditionally masculine traits. And these spaces are filled with men who have either gone through or are currently experiencing similar problems to the men seeking help. And so there is an inherent safety in their vulnerability. Unlike with Clifford's first psychologist, they don't have to worry about being targeted as the problem simply because they adhere to more traditionally male values. Now, of course, it would be disingenuous not to mention that psychotherapy, even in its current form, has proven beneficial for both men and women. But personally, I think this only confirms what we've already discussed. Genetic predispositions are not determinative. And so for the men who may be predisposed to these traditionally masculine traits, but who for one reason or another don't place any value in them, psychotherapy in its current form would be beneficial for them because of course they would only feel constricted by these traditional ideals. And I just want to make it 100% clear that I do not dispute these findings. But after decades of research and countless movements and programs designed to get men into therapy, I think it's fair to declare that despite this evidence, it is clear that this current approach is not working. There is still a general reluctance from men to pursue therapy as a means for mental stability. Society's attempt to essentially reprogram these men has seen little to no success over the past three decades. And unless we start to acknowledge the innate biological differences between the sexes and develop solutions that account for these disparities, as we saw with the PPPM model, we will likely only subject ourselves to another three decades of stagnation and the male suicide rate will remain unaffected. In short, we need to stop treating men like they're just broken women. But in any case, I think that's gonna be it for this one. If you made it this far, thank you so much for indulging me. Again, the purpose here isn't to declare that men don't need help or to say that men are more emotionally mature than women or that women are more emotionally mature than men. As I said before, that argument to me is a complete waste of time. And obviously it is undeniable that men do need help. The only statement here is that we need to change our approach when it comes to men's mental health. In any case, thank you again for watching. I do hope all of this made sense, but of course, if it didn't, please feel free to let me know why so that I can try to address any misconceptions in the comments. But with that said, I wish you all the very best going forward. Take care of yourself and I will see you in the next one. Peace.